Hello and welcome to Yarmouth Harbour on this fine spring morning. My name is Peter Isaacs and this is part two of Tales of the Western Solent. Soon the last adult survivors of World War II would have died and those of us who were children during that period are also becoming scarce, at least those of us who can remember anything about it are. But my brother, Yarmouth-born Tony Isaacs, uh, Dave Kennett, former lifeboat coxswain here in Yarmouth, and I can remember some aspects of uh, that mighty conflict and how it affected us and what happened around here in Yarmouth. Uh, so we're going to spend some time during this uh, part two in what happened here in Yarmouth during World War II. At the end of the war, Tony was aged eight, Dave was six, and I was four. We're joined by Alec Coates, uh, Yarmouth-born, and a mere 75 years old, which makes him really still a nipper. As in part one, uh, Caroline Dudley, a local historian, and uh, born in the West White, will put us right on dates and facts and of course, Tony Toller will string the whole thing together uh, to make what I hope you will find to be an informative and enjoyable part two. Here we go. France has been Britain's longest enemy uh, ever since the beginning of time. Um, and it wasn't, of course, until 1914 that Germany became our enemy. But all the fortifications <laughs> in the Western Solent are actually been built in the uh, mid-19th century uh, to deter the French from attack. The island's current population is 142,000. The Black Death, which occurred during the period 1348 to 1349, is thought to have reduced the island's population by a third. During the current COVID-19 pandemic, 406 mainly elderly people uh, have died. Compare this to the casualties during the Second World War, which were 214 killed and 274 seriously injured, resulting from German air attacks. Uh, during the 14th and 15th centuries, the island was attacked twice by Castilian at Spanish and French raiders. During the first raid, they destroyed the port of Newtown and seriously damaged Yarmouth. During the second raid in the 15th century, Yarmouth's population was thought to have been reduced to 100 and the dastardly French burned down the church. In response, King Henry VIII ordered the construction of a series of forts along the south coast and Yarmouth Castle, which is over there, was completed in 1547. The island was again threatened by the Spanish uh, Armada in August 1588, but they were seen off and of course uh, Admirals Frobisher, Drake and so on uh, put them to flight and destroyed them uh, or scattered them rather with fire ships off Gravelines. Not until Napoleonic times in the 19th century was the island threatened again. Uh, the government's response uh, under Prime Minister Palmerston was to build a series of forts uh, from Yarmouth all the way to the Needles, of which we will be seeing them as we uh, go along the coast. Um, after the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force from France in 1940, again the island was threatened with, uh, with invasion uh, from Operation Sea Lion. But we'll begin with a rather more recent threat, uh, to be exact, in 1958. And we'll go along to Newtown to see what that was all about. With our trusted skipper Dave Kennett at the helm, we leave Yarmouth Harbour and head east along the northern coast of the Isle of Wight towards Newtown. We're now in the entrance to uh, Newtown Creek and over there is the ancient port of Newtown which was established by the Romans uh, but was destroyed by the French in uh, 1377 and in fact it never recovered uh, from that raid. However, the tranquility of this uh, outstandingly beautiful area was threatened uh, in 1957 by a proposal to build just up there a nuclear power station. Can you believe it? Had it been built, of course, by now it would have reached the end of its life and it would be sitting there as a monstrous uh, concrete structure till the end of time, no doubt. Understandably, there was considerable local opposition to this proposal, 
but the land on which much of the station was to be built was owned by the Kindersley family at Hampstead Farm, which is up on the ridge. And Colonel Kindersley um, gifted much of the land on which the station was to be built to, to the National Trust, and it was that action which effectively scuppered the plan. And this whole area around here is now owned by the National Trust and is one of the most uh, beautiful parts of the uh, South Coast. Our next stop is just to the east of Yamas on the North Coast. We are now off Boldener Battery to the east of Yarmouth and we're probably about over an archaeological site which is between six and eight thousand years old of which Caroline is now going to tell us something. Yeah, so um, about 11 metres below the water is um, the most important Mesolithic archaeological site in Europe. In the 1980s a diver discovered what he thought to be a preserved prehistoric forest here then in 1999, the Marine Archaeological Trust, which is based in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, they went down, look at the site and survey it, and they found a lobster in its burrow underneath um, a fallen oak, and it was uh, turfing out worked Mesolithic uh, flints. You sure so it wasn't got... clasping a flint in its claw <laughs> yes. and hitting another lobster? <laughs> So anyway, they got very excited about this and they found more of these flints. Since then, there's been a lot of work done on the site. So yes, it was a, at a time that when the Solent was a river and the, uh, well, the Isle of Wight and the mainland were still connected to Europe. This is how far we're going back. So there was a, ha a habitation here of these uh, Mesolithic peoples. There's a lot of discoveries being made about how more advanced they were than we initially thought. So apart from finding about a thousand worked flints, they found signs of worked uh, wood. So they found about 100 pieces of worked wood, which more than doubles the amount of worked wood in Britain by Mesolithic peoples. And some of these pieces of wood look like they would have formed a platform. And there's also a log, looks like a log boat or a trough. So if it is a log boat, it would be the earliest boat building site in the world, known in the world. And also DNA studies have in the plant materials, there's a sort of peat underneath as if it's been compressed and it's been preserved really well because it's anaerobic conditions. In the peat, um, they've done DNA studies and found signs of the earliest type of wheat. So this is 2,000 years ahead of what they thought people were farming wheat. So that these peoples were much more advanced than previously thought. So it's a very important site. But unfortunately it's getting eroded all the time and different parts of it being exposed. So they need to study it as soon as it gets uncovered. Otherwise everything's going to disintegrate. So the Marine Archaeological Trust so Marine Archaeology Trust, they're trying to get funding to do more work all the time before this important site is lost. Well, it's been lost for uh, about 6,000 well, years. Yeah, We've only rediscovered water. recently, so <laughs> yeah. what the hell? You, uh, you talked about this having been a river. Yeah. How, how long are we going back? Well, 8,000 years. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> well, the, the, the sea broke through between the, the Needles and Swanage only 4,000 years ago. Wow. So it was a river until then. Within a few minutes and on our way back to Yarmouth, on our left is the Eastmore Estate. Eastmore House was originally built by the Johnny Walker Whiskey family. In 1935, it was acquired, along with the adjoining property Eastmore, by Almina, the widow of George Herbert, 5th Earl of Carnarvon, and Chatelaine of Highclere Castle in Hampshire, of Downton Abbey fame. She had remarried only eight months after the Earl's death in 1923. She was believed to be the illegitimate daughter of banker Alfred de Rothschild and had been left today's equivalent of £59 million. The fifth Earl interestingly used her money to finance the excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb. He died in Egypt in 1925 from a mosquito bite thought to be the curse of Tutankhamun. During the Second World War, Almina ran the house as a convalescent home for servicemen. It was sold in 1946. Sadly, Almina was declared bankrupt in 1951 and she died in poverty in 1969. In 1947, approval was given uh, by the Isle of Wight County Council to establish a, uh, an approved school 
at Eastmore House to be run by the Roman Catholic Order of uh, uh, Brothers, uh, De La Salle Brothers, and it was for Catholic boys between the ages of 15 and 18 and could accommodate up to 80 pupils. It ran uh, very successfully until in 1968 there was a complaint by a member of staff against the then headmaster, Brother Cassian, who had been there for 21 years and the latter six years as the headmaster. And it alleged that he had used excessive force when punishing boys. Jim Callahan was at the time the Home Secretary, who actually had a farm at Wellow. He had an inquiry carried out, and it was found that only on two occasions was excessive force used to punish boys by Brother Cassian. And Jim Callahan decided that he should be moved on. Uh, there was a local petition raised, signed by 3,000 people from the West White, who wanted Brother Cassian to be reinstated because they all reckoned that he had run an outstandingly successful approved school and eventually their home was uh, closed in the mid-1980s. The site is now a uh, well-known Port LaSalle and has got some uh, really expensive houses on it. Um, but I think uh, those of us who've lived in Yarmouth a long time can remember the approved school boys. A few of them were taught boat, well, they were all taught boat building. Some of them built some boats and then got into the boats and paddled across to the mainland, but they were soon captured. Brother Cassian would always uh, sort out uh, disputes between the boys by putting them in a boxing ring. And uh, St Swithin's had a, had a very successful amateur boxing team. Peter, younger people probably don't know the word approved school. Can you just enlighten us? Uh, these days it would be known as a, an establishment for young offenders. We'll now talk about uh, Yarmouth during World War II. When war was declared on the uh, 3rd of September 1939, the Isle of Wight became a closed area and that lasted until 1945 and it meant that no people were allowed to travel from the mainland to the Isle of Wight or from the Isle of Wight to the mainland, apart from those on official government duty and in course including troops. Carrying cameras, telescopes or binoculars was prohibited and that's why there are so very few photographs uh, of this area taken during the war. Uh, food, clothing and petrol were of course rationed, a blackout was imposed uh, on pain of fines and the island went on to a wartime economy. Those men who didn't join the armed forces were employed, generally speaking, in building works, and that is coastal defences and the like, and the shipbuilding at J.S. White's at Cowes, or aircraft at uh, Saunders Row. All leisure craft were ordered to be immobilised or laid up ashore. In 1942, and I quote from a, a newspaper article, four well-known Yarmouth yachtsmen, including the Vice Commodore of the Solent Yacht Club, were each fined 10 shillings for failing to immobilise their yachts. All the various um, forts and batteries along the coast were swiftly mobilised, mainly by the Territorial Army, but after the Dunkirk evacuation and the south coast becoming liable to invasion by Dr German troops, then regular army units arrived in the Isle of Wight. On Yarmouth Dump, there was an anti-aircraft battery of 40mm Bofors guns established. And Tony, you can remember seeing these guns. I can just about remember it. But uh, I can remember getting tin fruit from the crews. What are your memories? It was great fun, really. Uh, the, the, the troops that were stationed in Yarmouth really looked after the kids of Yarmouth. If you felt a little bit peckish, you might go into the... Um, kitchen and pick up a few crumbs off the table and they'd say would you like something to eat and they say oh yes please yes please and they go and open up a flipping great tin of pears or peaches and this stuff was not available to the general your mums and dads in the shop they, they weren't there but the troops were loaded up with it and of course they were very very generous and keep us kids going they gave us parties at christmas time Fantastic. They played with us. They let us play with um, model aeroplanes that were made as identification purposes for the, the gunners. Um, that was great. I have only really happy memories of wartime Yarmouth. Well, Yarmouth was never bombed, and I won't say that, that was because of the deterrent provided by the four 40mm ACAC guns. It was just that Yarmouth wasn't a significant target, although it did have a lot of troops here. And the harbour soon filled up with a variety of military craft. Uh, before our uh, dad went away to join Trinity House, he and his chum Bob Cotton 
dug an air raid shelter in the back garden. The only trouble was that the first spring tide, when the water used to come up to the bottom of the garden, and of course the water table rose as well, our uh, air raid shelter, which was about 10 feet from the bottom of the garden, filled with water. So that was the end of our air raid precautions until we were issued with a Morrison shelter, which we had in the front room, and Tony and I slept in that for the rest of the war. You slept in an air raid shelter? In the house, yes. Oh, in the house, yes. sorry. Right. In the front room? Yes. Yarmouth had a 45-man home guard platoon when that was established, I think, in 1940. Yarmouth Town Hall became the ARP, that's Air Raid Precautions Headquarters Signal Centre, and the George Hotel, which was then known as the Pier Hotel, was the headquarters of the West Solent Patrol. Now, the West Solent Patrol was commanded by a well-known local resident, uh, Lieutenant Commander Hans Hamilton, and it comprised three former private yachts, the La Roque, the Lantony, and the Leprechaun. These three yachts were moored off Yarmouth Pier and they formed what was known as the Examination Service. Now the purpose of the Examination Service was to board all civilian merchant ships coming into the Solent and fishing boats and to carry out inspections to determine whether either were or were likely to be of assistance to the enemy. So that patrol, say, was uh, established soon after the beginning of the war. And one of the yachts, the La Roque, was owned by a 21-year-old Bristolian named George Butler, who had bought her, she was 76-foot, Camper Nicholson built. He bought her a couple of months before the war, and on the declaration of war, he volunteered himself, his crew of three, and La Roque for service with the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve and arrived here shortly after the outbreak of war. They all lived in the George Hotel and as happens now from time to time the cellars of the George Hotel flood and the uh, labels come off the wine bottles so when they had wine with their dinner Mrs Greenland the proprietor would always insist that they had the bottles which had no labels on regardless of what price they paid for it. So where were the guns? The guns were where the trees are now. And there were a number of um, Nissen huts for the cookhouse and the accommodation of the gun crews. Uh, it was a uh, half a battery, so I would anticipate there were about a total of 35 to 40 soldiers here uh, from about 1940 to 1945, most of whom came from West Yorkshire. Operation Dynamo was the spectacular evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force from Dunkirk and La Roque and then followed by Lantony across to Ramsgate and then across to, to Dunkirk and La Roque arrived on the afternoon of the 26th of May. Shortly thereafter she was joined by Lantony and during the next uh, five days they ferried troops from the beaches to the largest ships waiting offshore and indeed made a couple of trips back to Ramsgate and between the two of them they carried off 465 troops. Uh, they both went aground at one stage during the evacuation. So Anthony was damaged by shell splinters but uh, La Roque was undamaged. By the time they came back to Yarmouth, the Royal Canadian Navy officer uh, in command of uh, Sir Anthony was awarded a Distinguished Service Cross and George Butler was mentioned in dispatches. George went on to command ocean-going tugs, escorting convoys from Liverpool to Freetown and finished the war as a first lieutenant of a destroyer in the West Indies. At the end of the war, La Roque was re-engined and handed back to her owner and George was my father-in-law. The town of Cowes is not in the Western Solent, but it would be amiss of us to exclude a spectacular event that took place there involving the Bliskowice, which was built at J. Samuel White's shipyard for the Polish Navy. On the night of 4th of May 1942, Bliskowice was instrumental in defending cows from an air raid by 160 German bombers. The ship was undergoing an emergency refit and, on the night of the raid, fired repeated rounds at the German bombers from outside the harbour. Her guns became so hot they had to be doused with water from the River Medina. Extra ammunition had to be ferried over from Portsmouth. This forced the bombers to stay high, making it difficult for them to target properly. The ship also laid down a smoke screen, hiding cows from sight. The town and the shipyard were badly damaged, 
but it is generally considered that without this defensive action, it would have been far worse. On the 19th of May 1942, the 1st Battalion, the Royal Regiment of Canada, arrived here at Norton Holiday Camp, soon followed on by the Essex Scottish and the South Saskatchewan. They were here for six weeks of intensive training in preparation for Operation Rutter, which was the invasion of Dieppe, which actually didn't occur as Operation Rutter, but I'll get to that in a moment. Almost 80 years ago to the day, on this piece of ground, the Canadian troops held a party for all the children of the West White. They sent trucks around the West White to gather up the children and their mothers, rather like the Pied Piper. They brought them here and we had a magnificent party. I was probably no more than one and a half, but this is my very first memory, and I can remember being pushed along a conveyor belt here in a little box by Canadian, Canadian soldiers. And when I see the pictures of the bodies of Canadian troops piled up dead against the defences of Dieppe, I wonder if any of those were the men who pushed myself and the other kids of the West White along this track. Out there beyond is Yarmouth Roads. And on the, on the 2nd of July, all the troops embarked both from the pier at Fort Victoria and from Yarmouth Harbour and from the pier. They boarded two transport ships with former Belgian cross-channel ships, the Princess Astrid and the other one whose name escapes me. They are all loaded. There were over 200 ships out there from, from here up to Cowes awaiting the launch of the operation which was due to take place on the 7th of July. But on the 4th of July a flight of Focke-Wulf 190 aircraft came here and bombed both of the two transports. They didn't do too much damage because the bombs didn't explode, but certainly enough to take both ships out of action. The troops were transferred to other vessels. But within a couple of days the weather turned bad and they missed the tides and the favourable moon conditions and therefore Operation Rutter was cancelled and was not resurrected until August 1942 when it became Operation Jubilee which was the precursor to the invasion of Normandy on the 6th of June 1944. After the departure of the Canadian troops, the two holiday camps uh, became known as HMS Manatee, which they were called um, Royal Navy Stone Frigates, and they were the centre for amphibious training for the rest of the war. D-Day occurred in, on the 6th of June 1944. I've got only one memory, which is being at Allen Bay, which is our grandfather's house, and watching the Trinity House vessel Andre Blondel uh, sail out through ahead of the invasion fleet uh, on her way to mark the channel to Normandy. Uh, Tony, I think you've got a few more memories of D-Day. I can remember sitting out on the cliff at Allen Bay and counting the ships going out through. Well, of course, we didn't know, or well, I certainly didn't know, that it was D-Day. It was just like an everyday occurrence to me. I'd sit out on the cliff and watch all the, 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 the traffic going to and But that particular day, I got up to 381. I can remember that name, that number's firmly infixed in my mind. But that's really all I remember about it. After D-Day, uh, most of the troops on the Isle of Wight uh, disappeared, of course, uh, into uh, Europe. The forts uh, around the coast remained manned, uh, but were deactivated at the end of the war, apart from Golden Hill Fort and Fort Victoria, and they were uh, closed down in the 1950s. Normal activities gradually resumed, although rationing of food continued for some years. I can remember um, when a chap called uh, Jeff Cotton came home, we, Tony and I were living in a little house up at Mill Road in Yarmouth and we were woken up seemingly to us in the middle of the night and there standing at the top of the stairs was a chap in a khaki uniform and he'd got this yellow thing in his hand which of course we subsequently le learned was a banana. This was peeled and thrust at us and we'd never seen a banana before or even heard of a banana. What? But this was uh, sometime in late 1945 and we ate this thing and I don't think I enjoyed it and I don't think you did either. Well, what, what I remember is really about the banana was the absence of yellow because all I can remember about my very first banana was that it was nearly black 
and I was a little older than Peter, so I was a bit more aware of apples and pears and all the rest. But I knew bananas should be yellow, but this was unfortunately nearly black, and I'm very disappointed. But it tasted all right. <laughs> well, I've only got one more thing to say. In 1961, Carnival Week, I was home on leave with a, a chum of mine named John Sarr, and in those days, Yarmouth was sometimes visited by one of the largest private yachts in the world, and this was the Shamara, owned by Sir Bernard and Lady Docker. And she was moored uh, about 100 yards off the pier. John and I had had a few drinks in Yarmouth, and we decided it would make a lot of fun if we were to go out and throw some thunder flashes onto the deck of the Shamara. So we uh, borrowed a dinghy, it was by this time dark, um, rode out to the Shamara, uh, the tide was certainly uh, against us, so it was a, a hard pull. She was all lit up and we pulled the fuses on the th two thunder flashes and threw them on the deck. And I think, if I remember rightly, it's a four second delay before a thunder flash goes off and they make a hell of a bang. And we rode like hell back to Yarmouth and were either disappointed or greatly relieved that there was absolutely no reaction for anyone on the Shamara at all. And I can only assume that there was none, no one ab uh, aboard. Well, that's what I remember. I contacted my old friend, uh, John Sarr, who now lives in New York. And he, like me, is 81 years of age and asked what he had to say about it. Now, John, when he uh, completed his national service, uh, he uh, resumed a journalistic career and uh, he eventually became the uh, life bureau chief in the Far East and he spent four years covering the war in Vietnam and uh, I have recently been reading some of his dispatches which he wrote between 1970 and 1974 and I have to say that if he didn't suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder I would be very surprised because the, his dispatches are quite extraordinary. Anyway, this is what he's got to say. Well, we're talking about events of 60 years ago, so a good deal of memory has disappeared in that time frame, but so has the statute of limitations. It's also run out. <laughs> so the attack on uh, the docker yacht, I only remember the preamble, which involved a great deal of drinking, um, and, um, and I mostly remember that in the, leaving the scene of the crime, crime. Um, we were driving back to uh, Peter's encampment and um, it occurred to me that it was a shame to leave all these thunder flashes unused so I tossed one out of the window as we drove along. Well, I'd no sooner thrown it, it seemed to me, than a police car came around the corner towards us and um, the timing was, well, perfect. It blew up and we heard it very clearly. <laughs> Peter stepped on the gas and we got the heck out of there. <laughs> so that was it. It was, it, was, uh, it was a great time in those days and Peter was a great companion. He's been a lifelong friend for which I'm most grateful. Well, thank you and good night. We're now in Totten Bay. And Caroline Dudley, our local historian, is going to tell us something about the development of Tottenham Bay, in particular its pier and of the hotel. Over to you, Caroline. Yeah, the Tottenham Bay Pier and Hotel Company was uh, formed in 1878 by a group of speculators from London, um, Messrs Fox, Harvey and Norton, um, for the purpose of building a hotel and pier at Tottenham Bay. And there wasn't an awful lot at Tottenham Bay at that time, um, just a few scattered farms and uh, a few villas had been built in the 1860s and a church at Christchurch in 1875. Otherwise, there was not much here at all. The island had become very popular as a tourist destination at that time because Queen Victoria had taken up residence in Osborne House and also this side of the island had the added attraction of um, the home of Alfred Tennyson at Farringford. Um, so lots of tourists were coming to see him here because he was a bit of a celebrity. So you know, the hotel um, and pier company leased land from the ward estate and they also purchased some land from the war department 
to build the pier and the hotel. And in May 1880, the new um, Smart Hotel, which was up on the cliff top above the current pier, um, had, was opened in Whitson and uh, provided 20 bedrooms. Um, there was a billiard room, tennis lawn, and the bay was um, said to have excellent sands, good anchorage for yachts. The air was described as bracing and distinguished physicians said uh, the climate was unsurpassed any other place in England, even in the winter. So, yeah, the hotel was built on the cliff top and the pier opened in uh, July 1880. The new pier was 450 feet long and had a walkway 14 feet wide and the whole uh, structure was supported on cast iron columns. The pier head was supported by Greenheart timber piles uh, and Greenheart is a very durable marine uh, wood that comes from South America. The first pier master was Alfred Isaac, who was um, also pier master at Allen Bay, and uh, he was Tony and Peter's great, great grandfather. grandfather yeah. How he managed to be pier master of two piers at the same time when they were owned by different companies, I don't know. <laughs> but it was something to do with uh, painting Maverick uh, red hull the same as, <laughs> as the lighthouse. So there was some funny business going on. It obviously runs in the family. <laughs> so yes, then um, steam began to call regularly at the pier and trips to Tottenham Bay proved very popular with excursions. In September 1885 four steamers were at the pier all at once, all laden with passengers, while in July 1886 a total of 13 steamers called at the pier in one day after additional services of boats commenced between Lymington and Tottenham Bay uh, in connection with the London train. Hard to imagine now these steamers at the pier. So this, yeah, this was the London and South Western Railway Company and provided a connecting service between Waterloo and Totland four times a day and between Totland and Waterloo three times a day. The, the entire journey taking as little as three hours and 35 minutes. That's which... faster than today. <laughs> the hotel proved very popular with wealthy tourists and it was more than doubled in size in 1891. And this is when the distinctive turret was added. During World War I, the Needles Channel was closed, but steamer services continued to run to Totland Pier during much of the war. A full ferry service resumed in 1919, but it was reduced in 1925 and ceased altogether at the end of the 1927 season, when it was likely to have been quicker for passengers to disembark at Yarmouth and take the omnibus to Totland. However, excursion steamers continued to call at Totland until the end of the 1931 season when the pier was considered unsafe. And during the Second World War, of course, um, uh, a section was uh, destroyed in the middle to, well, it was, yes, it was... to uh, prevent possible landings by yeah. Germans. But after the war, it was all uh, repaired. And of course, uh, Dave, I think your first job was on Totland Pier. I remember tying up all the paddle steamers and... Uh, in fact, there was the, the embassy that uh, came in quite often. Uh, it was the monarch, Empress of India, and the consul. And the old consul, I remember, she was uh, steam-driven, and you could see her chimney, uh, the, the smoke coming out of the funnel all the way along the north shore over there before she could turn around the shingle bank. Mm -hmm. And it was quite interesting to see, but um, she used to plod along at about five or six knots, and invariably used to turn up at the pier so late that everyone was getting a little bit fed up. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but Going back to Pilot's Point, when I was working for Vic Stallard, in the winter we converted that from a restaurant to living accommodation, and um, that was also an annex to the hotel. At the same time, but somebody else, a fellow called Jack Staniforth, he converted the waterfront from uh, a restaurant to bedrooms again for the annex to the hotel so there were all three buildings there we had something to do with let me take you back to the time when i was about 13 years of age and you were working on the pier tying up these paddle steamers i had a friend uh, staying with me and you had said to me if you want to go up to cows anytime on a paddle steamer come on down to the pier and i'll let you on you see without a ticket obviously so Lawrence and I decided we would take Dave up on this and we got to the pier and I can see you now, you had a white polar neck sweater on, he said come on, come on and we scrambled up the gangplank and off we set to cows. What you didn't tell us of course was that we had to get off at cows without a ticket. So we got to cows about an hour later whatever it is 
and to our consternation saw all the passengers getting off. So we waited amongst the lifeboats until everyone had gone and there was no longer a member of the crew on the, uh, on the um, gangplank and then uh, sneaked ashore. But of course we had to come back again uh, before the crew appeared at the head of the gangplank to recheck the tickets, which we managed to do by hiding somewhere. Got back to Totland and coming in and Dave was there on the pier and as we started to come down the gangplank with all the other passengers, he shouts out, tickets please, tickets please, <laughs> knowing full well that we hadn't got any. <laughs> Remember that quite well, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, 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 the pier has been used for the pilot boats. Um, when we used to have lots of ships stand through here, every Friday you would have the uh, uh, all about nine ships, or the Pino and uh, the castle boats all coming down through at the same time, and they all needed a pilot. Well, they had pilots down, and they had to be taken off at the needles. So uh, we had a big, uh, we had various ships, uh, pilot boats anchored off of. Uh, uh, Totland, they used to carry a little uh, launch that used to go f transfer the pilots between that and the ship. There was the Gurnar, the Brook, the Pender. Um, the Pender was a converted yacht, was uh, and changed into a pilot boat. But they used to anchor off here and come out, bring all the pilots ashore. And the pilots used to have a, they scaled down, yes. shipping up through here. They, they moved up to Yarmouth, a berth in the harbour with fast launches, 40-foot uh, launches, and they used to charge down and they knew when the ship was due off the needles, and they used to just be off the needles at the time, or vice versa. But uh, it was interesting um, for the, just the Trinity House, just watching what's happened over the years. Very, very yeah. few commercial shipping goes down this part of the... Uh, the sale of now it all goes out through the, the, the nab. Yeah. Uh, in addition to being the uh, non-resident keeper at the lighthouse, Tony was also the non-resident keeper for about a year at the nab tower. So he had two jobs until he was retired when he reached the age of 70. Interestingly enough, having been associated with Trinity House all those years, he'd worked for them for 40 years, he re-tendered for the contract, and I said to him at the time, you're 70 years of age, the chances of you getting it are not good. And sure enough, he did not get the, the contract. Uh, he received a notification from Trinity House at Harwich, thank you very much, your contract has not been uh, successful, and that was the end of it. And I was really annoyed about that, so uh, in fact I wrote to the elder brethren at Trinity House and said that this, is, to my mind, is quite disgraceful after all these years. There's been no recognition whatsoever of his uh, efforts, and indeed um, he got a letter of thanks signed by the senior member of Trinity House uh, several weeks later. But it was not a happy period, uh, particularly as he just bought a new boat. But there we are. Uh, talking about the ships coming down here, I can remember in the late 90s, my wife and I went on a QE2 cruise, mm -hmm. and we, we sailed down past Yarmouth yes. and everything. Yeah, yeah. What, what, why doesn't that happen anymore? Because uh, it's um, quicker the other way, oh. generally speaking. We were heading to Ireland, and I would have thought it was much quicker to come out here. Well, that, uh, you're, you're probably right. We're getting a few ships out through here at the moment. But nothing like it they used to be. No, no nothing. No. No. And as you said, Terry, the QE2 used to come through here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the last time that Alec told me these was standing on the shingle bank, which of course is normally under the water, mm. was to watch the QE2 go past. Oh. And I would have thought there was a good chance of being washed off with yeah. <laughs> QE2 going across. <laughs> Caroline, now there was a plan to build a tunnel oh. from Tottenham. Oh, yeah. Can you oh. tell us anything oh. about that? Well, I think you know, probably know more than me. But, um, yeah, Frank, a man who was associated with the hotel, he and uh, several others had an idea to build a, a tunnel underneath the Solent. And Frank, sorry, Ammon, he ran the Tottenham Bay Hotel from the, about, well, 1906 mm -hmm. to uh, into the 30s when he passed away. And uh, it was always his idea, you know, he kept this idea alive. Initially it was with Blundell Maple, who of furniture fame. So Blundell Maple actually uh, fitted out the hotel with lovely furniture. Uh, so it was with him and the 8th Earl of Egmont, they all had this idea to build a, a channel under the, uh, sorry, a tunnel underneath the Solent. But then Sir Blundell Maple died in 1903, and I think he probably was the biggest uh, financial backer. They had actually had permission, I think, and uh, they'd started making 
uh, drill or drilling on the other side of the Peter. That's right. Yes, yeah. and they had. The, you, I think you can still see them today, can't you? The, well, we could do yes. it now. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, because uh, Sir Blunder Maple died, it came to nothing. But yeah. it was going to come out at Fort Victoria. Fort Victoria. Yeah. yeah, it was to be a railway tunnel. Yeah. Uh, but it um, didn't happen, and of course, uh, people think that. Uh, a tunnel or a bridge is a new idea, and it's not a new idea no. at all. In fact, I think from the test uh, workings over on the other side, they got several hundred yards out under the sea. Um, whether it still exists or not, I don't know. After the pier was repaired in 1951 by George Priest of the Tottenham Bay Hotel, pleasure steamers called regularly once more. These were run by Cousins & Co, a subsidiary of Red Funnel, which operated an excursion fleet out of Weymouth and Bournemouth. Motor coaches would be waiting at the entrance to the pier to take passengers on round-the-island trips. PS Embassy was one of the paddle steamers offering full and half-day cruises to Tottenham Bay from Bournemouth in the 1950s and 60s. She was 190 feet long, able to travel at 14 knots and could carry 727 passengers. By 1966 she was the only steamer still calling at Totland. Unfortunately the port wheel was damaged as she was sailing back to Bournemouth in July that year. Although this was soon repaired, a, ser a series of gales either prevented or disrupted sailings, making it a poor season financially. Embassy's last sailing for the 1966 season was on 22nd of September, when she left Tottenham for Bournemouth late in the afternoon. In December, Cousins & Co's directors announced that the ship would be sold and services discontinued. After the paddle steamer ceased to call, Crows Unlimited of Bournemouth took over the excursions between Bournemouth and Tottenham Pier in their motor vessels Thornwick and Bournemouth Queen. However, these trips too ceased and by the 1970s the only such trips were those run by local boatmen to the Needles and Hearst Castle. In 1955 the Tottenham Bay Hotel was renamed the Tottenham Chalet Hotel and run along holiday camp lines, a type of holiday that was then very popular. However, by the early 1970s Cheaper air travel meant that holiday makers were preferring to go abroad. In addition, health and safety rules had become stricter and the Tottenham Shelley Hotel was forced to close at the end of the 1972 season. The hotel and pier were put up for sale. The advent of cheap flights abroad also meant that the demand for passenger ships was declining and those that did enter the Solent were doing so via the more easily navigable eastern entrance. When the Normandy ferries Dragon and Leopard ceased providing a row, row service to France using the Needles Channel, the demand for pilots based at Totland waned and in 1977 Totland Pilot Boat Station closed. The pier became increasingly dilapidated despite having a succession of owners all wanting to repair it. It was officially closed in the 1980s. Now, 40 years later, its renovation is finally nearing completion and it is hoped that the restaurant at the Pierhead will be opened in summer 2023 and that it would be possible to walk along the pier once more. We are now in Allen Bay and we're going to hear from Dave Kennett when he was a coxswain of the Yarmouth lifeboat of a rescue which was quite dramatic uh, involving a catamaran. So Dave, over to you. Back in 1993, the three people left Paul in the trimaran. A wind was a force um, they'd sit from the west and they, they were very sensible, they were great talented yachtsmen and they made their way from Poole and got about four miles off the needles when a gust of wind blew the trimaran completely over. The three then scrambled on board, looked around and it was in December, it was December the 13th and not much, there's not many yachts around, it was very quiet um, as far as uh, surface craft were about and one of the crew a lady called Heidi Bell volunteered to dive under the craft to recover some flares. She get dived under it, got the flares, and then quite cold, so she was went under again. Uh, she went under several times and brought various pieces of clothing out to protect them on the hull. Just one solitary tug at them to see the flares. They alerted the Coast Guard. We got the call late afternoon and proceeded like the helicopter. The helicopter was. Uh, proceeding as well the Royal Navy helicopter. We got there and uh, I could hear in the background on the radio that they were talking, the second helicopter were talking about bringing out a chainsaw and uh, an axe. 
and I wasn't happy about that, first of all, with the chainsaw going around on top of Heidi's head, for one thing, but as soon as it released the pressure, then the boat would have settled further down in the water, and that she would have had very little air left of... Uh, so that worried me a lot. I took over as on-scene commander of the whole thing, took responsibility. Uh, I got a t we got a tow line underneath and then we started to tow and I knew that we had very little time to get back up through on that flood tide because we were t um, the mast and the sail was um, down and it was dragging and talking to Miles, in, um, I was in completely communication with Miles on board the boat with one of our radios uh, talking to her and, and talking to me. I was saying can I go a bit faster and he said try it, slow down or whatever because in this case you know, it was quite choppy and uh, the I was worried about her being washed off of her perch inside. I was very concerned that um, Heidi would have been washed out through the back of the boat with if I'd gone too fast. But very slowly um, I had Tony on board here he was uh, on the cliff at that, no at that night. I don't know what he was doing that time of the night on the cliff but he remembers that it was too bad in Allen Bay where we are at the moment to here, so to I had to here. Unfortunately, just keep on going up to Tottenham Bay, where I knew I had a bit of lee from the land. And we went round and anchored in 40 feet of water, which was the depth of the mast, roughly. And we anchored in there. She had been trapped underneath, I think, for about six hours. And you can imagine a poor girl. And she was so calm, so calm. I can remember that there was no, um, she wasn't panicking at all. Miles was marvellous with her, talking to her, reassuring her. Eventually, a bomb disposal unit came out in another helicopter. And they dived down inside in quiet waters in Tottenham Bay. And eventually got her out. And the last I saw of her, was she, she was on the end of a high were um, heading for hospital. For her parents, uh, her mum and uh, we get postcards and uh, Christmas cards from both of them, remembering us of the day and uh, nice words from them. Uh, Lovely. And every year we get cards. Well, Dave Kennett, yours has been a life devoted to saving lives. 26 years of battling seas like these at all hours of the day and night. It was just after midday on December the 11th, 1993, when a trimaran capsized in strong winds and heavy seas off the needles. And it's thanks to you I'm here today. It's Heidi Bell with her friends Nick Slocum and Stephanie Merry. Now, Heidi, you were trapped in an air pocket under the trimaran for more than six hours. That's correct. When, I, when I ca we kept size, um, I landed in the freezing cold water and the, the boat was caving on top of me and I had no time to scramble out onto the top. Um, within seconds, I lost communication with uh, Nick and Steph, which was really scary. I, that was the most lonely time of my life when um, I lost touch with them. And I was underneath in this um, small air bubble thinking, my goodness, I'm on my own, but I'm still alive. What is going to happen? And even then, I was thinking about the lifeboat coming, so... <laughs> well, Stephanie, you and Nick managed to climb onto the overturned hull. Yes, and Heidi disappeared, and so we were really scared that she'd been swept away. We spent ages shouting for her, and it was a great relief when we heard her calling for help from underneath our feet. So, Nick, what happened then? Well, once we'd been able to contact Heidi and we were able to talk to her through the hull, we were able to get the, uh, or Heidi found the flare pack in actual fact and passed that up to an emergency uh, hatch. And we in fact uh, set off a number of flares throughout the afternoon, none of which were seen. And we were reduced to our last handheld flare and we let that off at the last minute when we saw a naval tug coming down the naval channel, the needles channel. Mm. And then luckily they raised the alarm and then Dave came along. Well, by then, of course, it was 4.45 p.m. and Heidi had been trapped for three and three-quarter hours. Now, we have a reconstruction of the scene when Dave's lifeboat sailed into view. Heidi, what happened next? Well, I was, it was about pitch black underneath the boat and I was aware for the first time of lights and that was the helicopter. And um, Nick had told me that it was the lifeboat and Steph had told me the lifeboat was on the way. And I could hear the propellers, um, the noise, churning up in the water. So. I felt tremendous happiness and I thought I'm definitely going to survive this ordeal and you know I was really happy. 
Well, the tide was dragging the vessel towards the rocky outcrops, past the needles and into the channel, and Dave, you made a crucial decision then. Yes, it was a decision whether to, uh, what to do, really. It was very, uh, it was choppy, and, uh, uh, and it was a matter of uh, getting Heidi out, and the only way was to tow her back into, right up through the Solent, into the, uh, into Tottenham Bay, where we had the divers day, and to finally rescue her. Yes, it was four miles to Tottenham Bay, where a team of divers, as you say, went into action. In the calmer waters, they were able to get a breathing apparatus to you, and after that six-hour ordeal, you were finally winched to safety. What were your thoughts at that moment? Well, when I was on the chime run, the adrenaline just completely went when I was up on the surface, and, um, and I just sort of collapsed. And I remember seeing Dave, not that I knew him then, or realised he was a coxswain particularly, but I remember seeing a very large man, silhouetted, Near the wheelhouse. <laughs> and, <laughs> you're not that. No. And um, I remember waving and seeing Dave, Dave responding and actually waving back. And I just felt completely overwhelmed with happiness. It's a lovely few moments then. And all I could think of was thank you very much for saving my life. <laughs> and thank you, Heidi and Nick and Stephanie. Well, Dave has now brought us uh, along the main bench, so we're pretty much under Tennyson's Monument. And I think it was in 1971, Alex, yeah. you were fishing along here in the dark yeah. and managed to run into the cliff. How did that happen? We did. We had a machine called a Deccan Navigator. You're probably very old. And um, it relied on coloured lines on a chart and uh, it was a radio operated thing and it jumped a lane and instead of being 45 we went to 44 or whatever and uh, it was foggy we ran in to get back to where we thought we wanted to be and uh, all of a sudden we saw the cliff coming the <laughs> yep. hill was put hard over and we struck just as we were running almost parallel to the cliff and that's where the boat she swung and uh, luckily it's quite deep water right up to the wall, right up to the cliff. So we were able to step off and uh, onto the rocks and climb the cliff, which is what we did. But we got to the top, John and I, and he got over and the top bit of turf, off the top of the cliff, fell off and took me with it. And I slid most of the way back down again. <laughs> so. Uh, rescue services were alerted obviously and the lifeboat eventually came around and picked me up and, um, and that was that and then the boys I, I knew nothing because I was injured I knew nothing for about a week and um, the gang of the boys came around and salvaged the boat and took it back to Yarmouth so we eventually took it to Cows and mended it and Dave, you were the coxswain of the lifeboat and yep. came round uh, that morning. Yeah, we were alerted. John had uh, gone to one of the houses in Freshwater Bay and uh, alerted and knocked somebody up about what, the earlier hours of the morning. Yeah, about, about one o'clock in the morning. John knocked on the door and said, uh, My mate's um, injured on his boat then underneath Tennyson's monument and uh, could you tell the coast guards and um, we um, knew that where the boat was in, in theory and we brought the boarding boat out the uh, the lifeboat boarding boat and um, and we a couple of the lads went ashore and, uh, and took Alex off the boat and um, then uh, we came round I got my old launch and Keith Hopkins, um, he went to Newport and picked up uh, about three or four big four inch um, pumps, uh, salvage pumps. I had my own and we came round in thick fog, freezing cold as you can imagine, it was in December. And we um, brought all the materials out and uh, a lot of rubber tire, uh, inner tubes, and we blew the inner tubes up inside just in case our repair didn't uh, work and eventually um, she came off about three o'clock in the morning 
in thick fog and then we had to negotiate all the way around the needles with no navigation gear in those days at all and it was just local knowledge and we used the uh, lighthouse, needles lighthouse to show us uh, this fog, sorry the um, fog signal and we, uh, we we followed, we followed the, the fog signal right the way around the lighthouse. Long so, time ago. Long time ago. But anyway, we. Um, but I've always wanted to tell this story because John Doe, to me, what a hero John Doe was to climb that cliff, thick fog, in the dark, and make his way to alert the, uh, the uh, services. I think what a chap, what a brave man he was. And it's never been brought up as a Alec. Never well, been said. And I We were both got to the top of the cliff. And I think it's just over. I just it's a, it's such a shame. It's just a shame that he's not, not really lucky not to have died. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. The logbook of the Needles Lighthouse. The it's been rebound in recent years, but the pages are very fragile. In fact, the first entry is the last entry. Uh, in 1859 of the old lighthouse up on the top and then the f next entry is of the new lighthouse. This is how Trinity House used to uh, look after. The lighthouse has been subject to regular visits and inspections usually by the master of the cows based Trinity House tender ever since it was opened in 1859. After each inspection an entry was made by the inspecting officer in this logbook. Now we started off at Yarmouth talking about uh, the Second World War. Throughout the period of the First World War between 1914 and 1918, there is absolutely no indication in the, uh, the Needles logbook that a state of war existed or there was any change to the routine or anything else. Again, uh, during the Second World War, there is no reference to anything to do with the World War until 1942. Between the 17th of August 1939 and the 4th of September 41, the lighthouse was visited by a Trinity House tender and inspected by its master on seven separate occasions. Most entries in the log state, inspected from motor vessel Andre Blondel, stationed very clean and efficient, signed George O. Sherman, master. Now, the quartermaster or the helmsman of the Andre Blondel was actually Tony? Yes. Um... My, my father, Peter, my father, his name was Jim. He was uh, a crewman on um, the Andre Blondel, which was seconded from the French at the start of the war. Uh, which I've been on a number of times, and it, it was great fun. It really was. But um, the 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 Andre Blondel was painted grey, just like a, a, a naval ship. And so people probably were seeing going up the road, up and down the stream, probably wouldn't know anything about it. But I remember it extremely well. She was based at Cowes and of course Dad was able to get home uh, from time to time and that's probably why I was born in 1941 because he was able to get home in 1940. Uh, <laughs> the entry made on the 10th of July 1941 states Inspected station, clean and efficient, wicks tested and found to be good. Rations provisioned are for reserves and not to supplement crew rations. They are only to be issued at the discretion of the keeper in charge, who is to exercise that discretion with the necessary consideration. Tony, you were age five in 1942, in July, and you were up on the cliffs behind me. What do you remember seeing? <laughs> I was indeed. It, it's hard, isn't it? Because in those days, little, we were allowed to climb the cliffs, go along the beach, five, six, seven years old. Well, I was on the cliff this particular day, and this, and I don't know that I would know that it was German. But this aircraft came in, and of course I didn't know what direction then, but it was from like um, a north-easterly direction, I suppose, going southwest. And it, I could see the tracer bullets coming from this German aircraft and hitting the lantern of the lighthouse. But I didn't think anything of it. I was a little kid, I what did I know? But I certainly remember, and I remember, I can see it now, actually, and um, quite dramatic. Yeah. Well, that was the 6th of July, 1942. Uh, it was attacked by uh, one, if not more, uh, German aircraft. 
The following day, Mr. G.C. Barker, superintendent of Trinity House Depot at Cowes, inspected the, the, the lighthouse and made the following uh, entry in the logbook. Inspected station at 1200 and 1300 after attack by hostile aircraft. Considerable damage to the lantern from cannon fire and light out of action. And then there is a long list of the damage but significantly absolutely no mention whatsoever of the three keepers who were present during the attack. But these days, of course, they'd be all uh, off for a month's counselling or something, but no mention whatsoever of the keepers. Temporary repairs restored the light by the 9th of July, so it was out of action for actually three days, but full repairs were not completed until September of uh, 42. Hereafter, life at the lighthouse appears to be returned to normal, but there is a number of notable entries. 27th of March 1946, electrification of the station about to commence. Between the 24th of April 51 and the 13th of November 52, the black painted band and the black lantern were actually changed to red. It took seven weeks to complete, and as I say, um, some of the paint uh, in the succeeding years seems to have gone astray, but... Uh, <laughs> Nothing uh, of any great note. 2nd of January 1958, television installed. 13th of April 1987, station undergoing moder modernisation, helipad. Despite the upheaval, noise and dust all found to be in good order. 11th September 1989, current automation programme deferred whilst awaiting a possible solar fit. The station will remain manned for the time being. Redesigned ladder access to and from the helideck still awaited before operational clearance can be given. Now it took two years from the start of the uh, construction of the helideck until it was declared safe for uh, operations. And it was largely because of the faulty design of the ladder uh, from the lantern up to the top of the deck. Tony, you've got a, a tale to tell about the underwater cable, which is there, because they, the, the solar uh, power idea was obviously abandoned and uh, they installed mains electricity from up on the, the old battery which came down the lift shaft out into the sea and along the cliff. But you had something to do with that. <laughs> well, in my latter years I took up scuba diving and I was diving in Allen Bay um, along the cable, following the cable along the seabed, no, 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 not officially, just, just for something to do. And I followed up over a ledge, and as it went up over the ledge, it had worn through. And it had worn through the outer um, rubber casing, it had worn through the wire, armour plated, and it was it was in a hell of a state. So, of course, I reported it to the powers of be, and um, they got it changed. But, my goodness, I did very well out of that job. <laughs> I can imagine. I was commissioned by the company from Cornwall that were that laid the new cable to recover the old one and to keep the proceeds from whatever I got from the sale of the old one. I did very well under that. We've now come to the end of uh, recording part two of this series. Whether we can do a part three, which I hope would be on lobster fishing, uh, remains to be seen. But there is still a hope, even though Tony is moving away from the island right. Uh, I was asked the other day what motivated me to get the three of us together to make these recordings. Uh, and I said, the passage of time, really. Uh, 18 months ago, my brother, who's now 85, was on the roof of his shed, managed to fall through a distance of about 10 feet, crawled into his ha house, uh, eventually found his daughter and was taken to hospital. They kicked him out after uh, three days with a bottle of pills and said, get on with it. Uh, Dave, I know, has had a uh, knee replacement, is no longer that steady on his feet. And when we were filming part one, slipped here on the boat, gashed his leg, bled like a pig, and walked home and never went to see the doctor. So we're all reaching the end. Except Caroline, she's got a bit longer to go. Uh, but it's been a great pleasure for me uh, to uh, be talking to these two old uh, fogies next to me. Old sorts, perhaps I should say. Uh, and I hope that um, those of you who will be watching this, both part one and part two, possibly part three, will have enjoyed it. Dave, what well, have you Well, yeah, Peter, I think it's great that you had this idea and uh, 
you've done really you've put a lot of time into this uh, as has tony uh taller and i think that uh, it's been really nice meeting up again and we could pass on some of the old things that we used to get up to and it's been a great pleasure to be a part of this video too and as peter said it would be very very nice if we could make video three in fact if we could entice tony to come back from from cornwall perhaps uh, he might come and uh, make the third one and uh, i'm sure we've got plenty more to say but uh, again thank you thank you all the team and it's been great to be a part of us yeah. well it's been great fun isn't it i mean we go we, we we've all been around here for 60 70 80 years and we've probably forgotten three parts of it but when you get together with people that you've known for years and you talk together um all this stuff comes back to you and it's been a real pleasure being involved in it all so whoever's involved in all of it well done please please continue and part three i'm sure yeah. will will be an education yeah. um i'd just like to say thank you very very much to tony for doing all the filming i know all the editing takes an absolute age and he's done a fantastic job. And I've really enjoyed going out in the boat. Uh, I did get to Scratchell's Bay, that was the original aim, but I, little did I realise I was going to have to do all this um, local history uh, talk as well. <laughs> I thought it was just going to be an isolated trip to uh, Scratchell's Bay. But anyway, yes, it has been very enjoyable and it's been great hearing all the local stories. Thanks, Tony. Yes, thank you, Tony. Without you, we couldn't have done it. <laughs> Do a very good.